Hey, good morning. Last week, good morning. Last week we started a series called The Struggle is Real because for many of us, we're in a season of life where we're really, we're really struggling. And the big challenge we're giving in this series is to get real about your struggles because if you do not get real about your struggles, you will continue to really struggle. What happens in seasons of struggle is we tend to get stuck and maybe even get stuck for such a long period of time that it, our struggle becomes an identity or we think this is the way it's always going to be and we just kind of live there. But this, what we believe in this series and what we challenged you last week is get real. Get real with yourself, get real with God, and get real with others, not necessarily everybody, but somebody, because if you, if you, you need to get real if you want to get moving. Being stuck in a season of struggle is nothing we would ever choose, but sometimes we make choices that keep us stuck in that season. And we really believe that this series matters because one, uh, on Easter Sunday, we asked anyone that was in this room to fill out a card and share your struggle. And we had it, had it done anonymously and we put those cards out on the board. Please stop by and read some of the struggles out on the foyer that people are, are, are living with these days. Man, some of you are really struggling. A lot of us are. And we want you to get real about your struggles because we want you to get hope and help. And for many of you, this series is important because you're in a season of struggle. You need hope and you need help. And we believe that Jesus can bring that to your life. Some of you aren't struggling now, but you will someday. So let's use this as preparation to be ready. And for many of us, we've struggled in the past. And what happened in that season of struggle, God did something for us. He was someone to us or he taught us something in that season where we can actually use our struggles to help others. And that is a big key. As a matter of fact, it's not just key like when you get through a struggle, use it to help others. I think when you're in that season of struggle, understanding the role God plays in helping you in that season and how he wants to use that even currently in the life of others is really important. The key verse for this series, I'd encourage you to memorize this verse. Paul tells us this, that Jesus said to him, my grace is sufficient, it's enough for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. And then Paul, when he reflected on that truth, this is how he responded. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. For many of us, we do not delight when struggle shows up. If you do, then you've got a whole different kind of struggle. Like, let's, let's talk about that because most of us, that's not our reaction. But Paul had a perspective of a reason why that's possible. Because when you're in a season of struggle, there is a unique opportunity to experience from God something you wouldn't in normal everyday life. And God can do something unique in your life. And one of the things we know about seasons of struggle is we need to understand that God is a God of replenishment. He does meet us and provide things for us that replenish us. We are created as human beings that are an open system, not a closed system. Let me explain what I mean by that. You are dependent on things other than just you. You are not self-sufficient. You're considered an open system, not a closed system. Let me explain what I mean by that. I'm gonna count to three, and on the count of three, I want everyone to hold your breath and just keep holding it, okay? Ready? One, two, three. Okay, we're going to try that again because some of you are not doing that. Let's try it again. Okay, ready? One, two, three. Now, I want you to just hold it for the rest of the service. You can't, right? You need oxygen to survive. You're an open system. You need food and nourishment. You need water. You actually need relationships. The human brain it really requires oxygen, glucose, and connection to others for it to be fully effective. Like, we were created by God to not be self-sufficient. But in seasons of struggle, we tend to lock down and circle the wagons and isolate, either out of fear, shame, anxiety, uh, guilt, whatever it is, or, or just embarrassment, I don't want others to know, and so we isolate. The thing is, we do that in good times as well. We tend to kind of say, I've got this, I'm gonna be self-sufficient. God created you to be an open system and rely on others. In fact, your life is kind of like a bucket that it gets, even in the normal seasons of life, it needs to be replenished because you pour out into others. You pour out into things you're doing or something comes along in life and starts punching holes in the bottom. And suddenly like, man, I'm, I'm doing great, but all of a sudden there's a unique stress that shows up or I'm battling an addiction or I've, I've got a health issue. 
And suddenly, as much as we try to replenish, we're being depleted. God is a God of replenishment. And the season you're in, whether it's a season of struggle or it's a season of, man, things are great. Beware the, the tendency in your life to, pull, to be self-sufficient. But God, Jesus said, my grace is sufficient. I am sufficient. You are not sufficient by yourself. You need me and others. Beware of that tendency and know that you have a need to keep refilling your bucket the right way. And the Apostle Paul experienced that. He wrote to this, this group in Corinthians, uh, you could call Corinth struggle city. I mean, they, they had all kinds of issues. So when Paul writes these letters that we get to read their mail of 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Paul is very honest about some of their struggles. He's also very honest about his own struggles. In fact, in this letter to the 2nd uh, Corinthians that he wrote to Corinth, struggle city, he opens it Unlike the other letters he wrote, where typically he would say, hey, this is why I thank God for you. Here's what you guys are doing great at. Instead, he kind of opens up saying, let me tell you something about struggles and, and how God works in that. Like, it was clear that they and even he were in a season of struggle. Look at this at chapter one. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion, the God of all comfort. Isn't that great to know that's who God is? Paul knew that because that's what he'd experienced that in your season of struggle or loss or challenge, whatever it is, God is the God of all comfort, the God of compassion, who comforts us in all our troubles. God provides refreshment, replenishment in seasons of challenge, all our troubles. But here's why. And this is a change of perspective. So that we can comfort those or others in any trouble with the comfort we are, ourselves receive from God. And Paul kind of says there's this idea that two things here. God replenishes. You're in a season where you're needing comfort for whatever reason. Something has happened physically, financially, emotionally, relationally, spiritually that has left you depleted. Or maybe it's just life itself. That God says, I want to comfort and replenish in that season. But he also gives this incredible insight about what's really important in a season of struggle. When we struggle, not only do we isolate, but we tend to think, I'm the only one struggling. Which means I'm not aware of your struggles, but I also think I've got nothing to offer you. Paul was in seasons of struggle where he was pouring himself out into the life of others. What if that was a key to him thriving? To say, I won't get stuck in a season where it's only all about me. You've got to get real about your struggles so you can get moving. That's important. But also, never think that you, you're in a place where you have nothing to offer others. Because God, what he provides to you and in you, he wants to do through you into the life of others. And when we isolate or withdraw, we think, I've got nothing to offer. And Paul said, no. God is the one who fills your bucket. And then he says, I want to help you pour that into the life of others. He goes on to say this. For just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, so also we comfort, uh, our comfort abounds through Christ. It overflows. If we are distressed, it's for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it's for your comfort, which produces in you, here's this great phrase, patient endurance. One of the things God is always trying to do in your life is build faith, build trust. And a part of that is this, this phrase that shows up again and again and again in the Bible that God is trying to build patient endurance. The ability to keep going when you don't want to keep going. And the ability to be patient to say, I'm going to wait for God and God's timing. Waiting is hard, but waiting is worship. When you're patient and say, I'm not going to fill my bucket with the wrong things or the wrong people. I'm going to wait and say, God, you've got a plan here. Will you be the God of all comfort to my life? I will wait and follow your lead but when we get in a season of struggle, we think it's just about me. But Paul says, if we're distressed, it's for your comfort. It's not if we're distressed, it's just so God can help me and then that's it. It's mo always more than just about me. And there's something in that that liberates us and gets us moving when we tend to get stuck in struggles. And life is a journey. We've got to have the ability to keep going even when we don't. And there were some seasons where Paul not only got stalled, he used some pretty extreme language. Verse eight, it says this, 
We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about the troubles we experienced in the province of Asia. We were under great, see if any of these sound like something you deal with, great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so we, that we despaired life itself. Indeed, we felt we had received the death sentence. Like Paul says, there's something that we experienced that it feels like I don't have the ability to endure this anymore. Have you ever used the phrase, man, I hit rock bottom? Or we're in the worst case scenario. I used that phrase once, then I realized, no, there's a couple more levels down there. There's a couple basement levels that I, I thought this was rock bottom. No, there's more. Like, just be careful about when you hit a bottom, when you hit rock bottom and you think, man, this is it. What's going to happen next time it gets worse? Be very careful. Your perspective is limited. And he even says this, and this is some language some of you used on your cards you turned in at Easter. We despaired of life itself. I, I know that some people in this room, I, if you, I don't know anything about you personally, but because of the cards that were in this room either today or at least on Easter Sunday said, I've considered thinking my life is done and helping get to that finish line a little bit quicker. God is the author of life. If you ever have thoughts that make you think that the best for way forward possible is to take your own life, that is not true. It's dangerous for you and for others. Please talk to somebody about that. But you're in good company. Paul despaired life himself, felt like he was a death sentence. There were others in the Bible who just said, I want to die. We're going to look at one in a minute. Just said, I'm done. Be very careful because God is the author of life. If he wants to bring life into you, and also he has a plan for your life. We're done when he says we're done. And if, he's, if you're not done, there's still life and story to be written. And Paul said, as we hit rock bottom and we're, we're dreading life itself, he said this, but this happened that we might rely, not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. The design flaw that was not there at design creation in all of us that happens because of the fall is we tend to try and be self-sufficient. I've got this. We do that when life is good. Hey, things are good. I don't need God. Life is, I've got this. Or we do it when things are tough and think, you know, I, I don't want to tell anybody. I'll just handle this myself. You're an open system. You were created to be connected to others, God and others. Be very careful. And Paul said, the thing we learn when we go through seasons of struggle is that it's not that we rely on ourselves. We rely on God, the God who raises the dead, who brings life to things that seem like they're dead. That was his belief. That's what he trusted in. This was a perspective of saying, I'm not going to look at my struggles through the lens of my struggle. I'm going to look at my struggles through the lens of the risen Jesus, the one who brings life. And here's what Paul knew. Verse 10, he has, past tense, delivered us from such a, uh, from such a deadly peril. He will, future tense, deliver us again. On him we have, current, set our hope that he will continue to go on delivering us. And then he says this, and you have a role in that. God has a role, but so do you. As you help us by your prayers. Struggle City was praying for Paul, and he said, it makes a difference. Then many will give thanks on our behalf for the gracious favor granted us in answer to the prayers of many. Paul had the shift of perspective in so many different ways that there's an opportunity in struggle. There's an opportunity that the struggle might go beyond me and impact the lives of others for the positive. And God can show up in a unique way and that he has done in the past, he'll do it in the future, and right now, that is my hope that he'll do it today. When we do not replenish, what we do is we become forgetful of who God's been in the past, what he's promised to do in the future, and who he could be right now. And a great example of that is a guy in the Old Testament named Elijah. You can read about him in 1 Kings. We're going to look at chapter 19, but 16 and following. Unfortunately, Elijah had this job title of prophet. Like when you went to look at his LinkedIn profile, it was like Elijah, prophet. And he was, you know, doing a picture or whatever a prophet would look like. And prophet is a tough calling. It was a tough job because you weren't in charge, but you had to talk to the people in charge and say, here's what God has to say. And a lot of times it's like, you're doing it wrong. Like that's not how you lead. Especially God's people, you don't lead that way. And Elijah had this job 
of leading a king named Ahab. God had, had seen, showed up in Elijah's life in this role in many times. He had seen him do, uh, provide for him in, in times of need. He had had this deal where Ahab had married this, this girl named Jezebel. And it's just one of the many reminders in scripture that who you kind of link arms with and do life with will shape you. And Ahab, the king of Israel, God's people, married Jezebel who believed differently and lived differently and was a terrible, terrible influence on Ahab. Ahab goes down as one of the most wicked kings and terrible leaders that there was. And it's, a lot of it had to do with who he listened to and who he did life with. Pay attention to who you do life with, whether it be as friends, as, as spouses, business, teams. Like, just be aware of who's around you. And Jezebel brought in this new idea that, hey, let's worship this God named Baal. And so there comes this big showdown where God shows up and he uses Elijah. And all of a sudden, the prophets of Baal are going to do their thing. And then Elijah says, no, my God's going to do his thing, but let's make it harder on me. And so he sets it up and he's talking trash and all of a sudden God shows up and proves that he's for real and all the prophets of Baal are wiped out and Elijah's left standing and like this is his Super Bowl moment. And he knew that this was God's moment of saying, man, my God is the real one. You guys are all wrong. You would think he'd have tremendous confidence. God provides, God shows up. My God is the God of truth. And then Jezebel, not the king, his wife, says to, to um, Elijah, so help me bail if you're not dead by this time tomorrow. That was her God, so, so help me bail. Get what I did there? Anyway, so, like, so Elijah, <laughs> emboldened by the God who showed up in a big way, responds this way in verse 3. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. Man, sometimes we're most vulnerable when things have gone really, really well. But at this point, when someone says... But, I think my plan, my to-do list is for you to not li be living tomorrow. I'm going to take that task on myself. Elijah runs for his life. It says when he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there. So notice that he has somebody kind of traveling with him, and he isolates. Sometimes a season of life where you isolate is a good thing. Sometimes it's not. And sometimes we isolate when we should be connecting. He says, why don't you just stay here? I'm going to go on my way by myself. Goes into the wilderness, came to a broom bush, sat down under it, prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. Then he laid down under the bush and he fell asleep. He runs for his life. He isolates himself. He says he wants to die and then he takes a nap. You know what he did, right? He got real. He was honest. This is my struggle. And this is how I feel. I want to die. But instead, he chose to take a nap. There's an important lesson because if you know the rest of Elijah's story, it's not how he saw it. Things were different than appeared. And the thing we have to remember in seasons of struggle as well as when seasons are good, how you feel today is not how you will feel forever. And if you make all your decisions about the future by how you feel today, It'll take you to some weird places. How you feel today is not how you will feel forever, but we project how we feel currently on the rest of our lives and on all the things around us. And we get this isolated, obstructed view seats perspective on our life. Elijah became very forgetful on God's track record, and he had this lack of perspective. But then he gets real and God shows up. He wakes him up from his nap and says this, at once, an angel, uh, an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. He looked around and there was by his head some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and then he lay down again. He took another nap. There's something very significant that happens here. He gets real and God shows up by sending an angel to minister to him. Practically, here's some food, here's some water. Go ahead and take another nap if you need Elijah. Go ahead and take a nap. When you're in a season of life, especially in struggles, if you are hungry, angry, lonely, or tired, halt, H-A-L-T, hungry, angry, lonely, or tired, move very slowly with your decisions. Because the choices you make when you are hungry, angry, lonely, or tired, 
you will look back one day and go, what was I thinking? You weren't. You were feeling. You weren't thinking. You were feeling. And so I would add the, 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 the letter S on the end, hungry, angry, lonely, tired, or stressed. We tend to react emotionally and make decisions that would someday we might regret. And when you're hungry, angry, lonely, tired, or stressed, it can lead you to making bad choices that take you deeper in to the struggle you're in or even create new struggles. So push pause and be very careful because if you feel like you're drowning in life, you will grab onto the first thing that floats, whether it's good or not. That's why if you go through lifeguard training, uh, they teach you to be very careful how you approach a drowning victim because you might both end up going down because you're there, you're offering hope, and they grab you, and they push you down to stay afloat, and you're the one that's trying to get them out. When you're drowning, you'll grab the first thing that floats, so be careful of what that something or someone is. When your bucket is empty, we try to fill it sometimes with the wrong something or someone, and then we wonder why life's not working right. God says, let me replenish you And he has this process of what he does with Elijah. Verse 7, the angel kind of sends a wake-up call and wakes him up. It says, the angel of the Lord came back for a second time and touched him and said, get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. He goes, you're going to get moving. You got real, we're about to get moving, and it's too much for you. So he got up and he ate and drank, strengthened by the food, and sometimes you just got to have a good meal. Sometimes you just got to have a good nap to get a new perspective. And it's enough where Elijah isn't saying, I'm just going to stay here until I die. He actually gets up and gets moving. Strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. Then he went to a cave and spent the night. Sleeping was a big player in Elijah's life. Sometimes sleep is a big player in ours too. And then in this moment, he has this encounter with God. Verse 9, it says this. And the word of the Lord came to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? What's happening? Tell me what's going on. Get real. So he replies, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant. That's true. They've torn down your altars. They have. And they put your prophets to death with the sword. They have. And they threatened him. I'm the only one left. And now they're trying to kill me too. Well, they are trying to kill him too. But he has this perspective that he's all alone. Struggles do that to us. I'm the only one who could possibly understand what I'm going through. Or I'm, the, I'm all alone right now. And Elijah experiences something very, very different. At that moment, he was alone, but remember, he left his servant behind, and he's running for his life. So unless everyone's going on this 40, 10K, whatever it is, with him, as he's running on this little journey away from Jezebel, yeah, you're all alone because you've, you've run to isolation. Then in verse 11, it says this, The Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord's about to pass by. There was a spiritual connection that he was about to get with God himself, not not an angel of the Lord, not a prophet of the Lord. God himself was going to connect with him in a unique and specific way. And what it says next is there's thunder and there's earthquakes and there's lightning, and it's real spectacular. And he's just kind of going, wow, this is amazing. And then all of a sudden, it says the Lord spoke not in the thunder or the earthquake, but in a still, quiet voice. And when Elijah kind of quiets the world around him, he hears from God. And this is what he says. Then a voice said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? Same thing asked earlier, and the exact same response. I mean, it's almost like he says, that was really cool. Like the thunder, the earthquake, wow, you're amazing. But I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected the covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets... Uh, to death with the sword. I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. Like, nothing about hitting the past, and nothing even God showing up in a big way thinking, hey, could you maybe bring that, could you bring the thunder to my situation, or you're meeting with me, clearly I'm still on your radar. And then God says that, it says that next he kind of, almost literally he put on his hoodie, like he puts on a hood over his head, and he kind of sits there, and God says, okay, here's what's gonna happen. You're gonna go, and there's two new kings leaders that are going to come into play. You're going to go anoint them and get them started. And I've got a protege who's going to be the next Elijah, and his name is Elisha. So like you guys will be carefully linked, and, and you're going to go talk to him and get him, and you're going to start, 
you're going to start pouring into his life. And there's three people. I've reserved 7,000 others who have not done what you thought they had done and given up on God and turned to Baal. No, there's 7,000. God always has people in the wings for his kids. He never leaves us alone. He is with us and he has others that are there for us, but sometimes when you're running from them, it's hard to find them. And God uses his people to refresh and replenish his people. God wants to use you to refresh and replenish people around you. You don't have to be the leader of your family, your team, your school, your organization, your business. You don't have to be anyone's leader to be someone that God uses to refresh and replenish others. But what you do have to do is be replenished and refreshed yourself so you have something to offer. And some of us have tried to be influences and the bucket is empty. We have nothing to offer. So we don't have what we need for our journey and we're of no help for others on theirs. Back to Paul, when he gets refreshed in a season of struggle, it says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 7. He kind of gives them a little update of kind of their, their track record and see if this sounds like your journey. When we came to, in, uh, into Macedonia, we had no rest. We were harassed at every term, turn, conflicts on the outside and fears within. I bet that describes how some of you have felt, maybe one or more of those. No rest, harassed, conflicts on the outside, external struggles, and fears within, internal struggles. Paul said, Paul, the apostle Paul, who wrote so much, God used to write so many of these parts of the New Testament. He used to take the, the, the church and the message of Jesus beyond Jerusalem into the world. We have Paul to thank the fact that we're believers today. But he said, man, I was in the weeds, harassed, conflicts, no rest, fear. But then he says this, God shows up just like he did for Elijah, but God who comforts the downcast, this is what God does. If you're downcast, if you're in need of comfort, if you're in need of refreshment, replenishment, God says, this is my specialty. This is what I do. I comfort the downcast. That's how he did it. He comforted us by the coming of Titus. Titus was this guy that was just like Elijah had Elisha as his protege. Paul had Timothy and Titus. Paul was pouring his life into Titus as he was going to be the leader for the church in Crete. Paul would go on to write a letter in the book of the Bible called Titus that was written to Titus that we can read today as he's replenishing and pouring himself into Titus. But Paul, the mentor, is refreshed by Titus, someone who's younger and less experienced, who comes in his life. We were refreshed by Titus, and not only by his coming, but also by the comfort you had given him. So Titus was in a place where he needed refreshment. That struggle city, Corinth, gave it to him and sent him on the journey who replenished Paul. And then Paul replenished the Corinthians by writing this letter and re replenished Titus by writing that letter. That's how replenishment works. God fills our bucket, not just to help us on our journey, but so we can help each other on our journeys. And if you've ever flown an airplane, you've probably heard him say this. Like if you're flying, they tell you about the oxygen mask, right? But they say if you're traveling with someone who's dependent on you, what are you supposed to do first? Their oxygen mask or yours? Yours. But, but it's a kid. Don't women and children go first? That's always heard about the Titanic. You know, women and children first. Or shouldn't we take care of the kids before we take care of us? Well, if, if you take care of the kid, who's going to take care of you if you pass out? If you want to care for others, you have to make sure that you're cared for well so you have something to give. Put on your own oxygen mask first so you actually have something to do to where you can help others. See, your struggle is real. It's very real. And you have to get real about your struggle or you will continue to really struggle. You have to get real replenishment too because their struggle is real. And we got to give compassion. Even when I don't understand a struggle is different than mine, I need to have compassion and saying, I want to give you a lot of grace because I don't get that, but man, I get that you're really struggling. My struggle is real, but so is yours. And maybe, even if my struggle is different, I have something that could be of value that God has poured into me that I could pour into your life because their struggle is real too. God replenishes us so we can replenish others. And for some sometimes for us, it's a change, 
that change of perspective that it's not like I'm struggling, I'm struggling, I'm struggling has changed. But I realized I'm struggling and you are too. And maybe God could help us, not just me and my struggles. Or maybe the help that I'm getting from God himself and from others, he pours into my bucket so I can pour into yours. See, just like we said last week, you have to get real to get moving. This week, it's this. You need to replenish if you want to keep going. Elijah, I mean, they said, the journey's too much for you. Life is too much for you. You were created to not be self-sufficient. And if you do not replenish, you will get stuck. You'll find out, nope, there's a couple more levels down. I've not hit rock bottom. There's a couple more basement floors. And you will be in danger of that becoming your identity. You have to get real if you want to get moving, but you have to get real replenishment. If you want to have something to offer. So let me ask you this. What is your replenishment strategy? What is your plan for getting replenishment in life? Because there are things in life that need to pour in to us. But there are also things at the same time that are poking holes in the bottom of our bucket. Sometimes we can do something about the holes that are being poked in the bottom of our bucket. We can change a relationship. We can change, uh, see a doctor, see, is there something I should do about changing my sleep or my diet? I could see a counselor to help me navigate some of the things going on in my head right now that I'm not fully sure what to do with. There are things we can do. But there are some things, we can't do anything about it. It's just a real struggle that will be there for a real long time. So it becomes more important that I'm making sure that whatever I'm feeding into my bucket are the right things to help me. Does that make sense? Like, there will always be, always be holes in the bottom of your bucket. Life drains you. So you've got to pay attention to what is going in your bucket and who you're doing life with if you want to replenish. Because you need to replenish if you want to keep going. So what's your plan? What will you do? Who will you do life with? Who will you be real with? Who will you look to kind of help and pour into you? And who, at some point, you have to ask, who could I pour my life into? Who could I invest in? We do a better job of caring for our phones than we do ourselves. If you have a phone like this, chances are, um, it's always distracting when I pull up my phone, there's a text message. I'm like, do you not know what I do for a living? But anyway, anyway. <laughs> He does. He knows what I do for a living. It was an important message. Um, <laughs> if you have a phone like this, chances are you charged it in the last 24 hours. Probably. If you have a phone like this, did you charge it in the last 24 hours? Raise your hand. Yeah. I mean, we do a better job of recharging our phones than recharging ourselves. If you have a car, chances are you stopped for gas sometime in the last month or you haven't been driving. We do a better job of caring for our cars than caring for ourselves. But God says, I don't want to use phones or cars to do my work in people's lives. I want to use people like Titus and even Struggle City and Paul and people here. I want to use you and pour into you so you can pour into the life of others. That's just how it works. That's why your replenishment is so important. It matters for your struggles and it matters for theirs as well. Elijah struggles um, and God replenishes him with some spiritual things, but also some very practical things. So spiritually and practically, what is it I need to pour into my life? Paul experienced that too. But the thing that Paul would say is there are some things that only God can do to replenish you. You could do everything right. The right kind of sleep, the right kind of diet, right kind of exercise. I mean, I've got everything arranged in life right, and I've even eliminated all the holes I can think of in my bucket. We've dealt with finances and relationships and emotions and job and everything is going great, you still have a hole in your bucket that only Jesus can fill. And Paul, this is how Paul prayed for us and for the church at Rome and for everybody who would uh, be influenced by him. He said, may the God of hope, that's who God is, the God of hope, fill you with all joy and peace. He said, I'm praying that God does that for you as you, and this is our role in that, as you trust in him. God, I trust you enough to recognize I need to be replenished. I need to be real with others. I need to be real with you. I need to be real with myself, but I need what only you can do. So that when we trust in him to be that for our lives, that you may overflow 
with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. You cannot fill your bucket without Jesus. And God prayed, uh, excuse me, Paul prayed to God, the God of hope, that we would realize that and let God fill our bucket. There are some times where you still need a nap and you still need to eat and drink water and connect with others, but being real with God and connecting with him is critical. And he says so much so that it will overflow with peace and joy and hope. That overflow is not waste. It's overflow that pours into the life of others. So you have to keep asking as well, God, fill my bucket and help me live my life in a way that replenishes so I have something to give. But who is it you want me to pour my life into? And be open to whoever he says. Sometimes it may surprise you. But that's my prayer for you guys and that's how I'm gonna close in praying and then I'm gonna ask Mark Porter, our executive pastor and Mike Buchanan, chairman of our elders to come up to talk about uh, my upcoming sabbatical. Lord, thanks that you love us, that you are for us, and that you took on the responsibility of filling our bucket in ways that we could not. Your grace is sufficient, but we are insufficient without you. It is only through Christ that we can truly experience all of life as you intended us to live. God, help us, give us wisdom to build a replenishment strategy for our life. Help us to live our life in a way that we are filled so we can overflow and pour into the life of others. Thanks for the people who do that for me, that do that for us. And in this season of struggle, God, please be the God of all comfort, the God of compassion, and the God of hope that pours into our life so that we can take that and pour it in the lives of others. Thank you that your plan for my life isn't just to help me with my struggle, but it's to do that and help me in the life of others. That's your plan for all of us. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Hey, uh, for those of you that I haven't met, uh, as Doug said, I'm the executive pastor here. Got to make this adult size. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, it's too easy. <laughs> so, about Doug's sabbatical. Uh, my name is Mark Porter. I wanna, uh, I'm the executive pastor here, but before I was the executive pastor on staff, I was an elder. Uh, and a member of this congregation, still a member, obviously, but uh, Mike Buchanan is up here with me. He's the chairman of our elders. Jay Harrell, Philip Archinall, and Randy Wright are also elders, and we're an elder-run congregation. And over the past several months, uh, we've been uh, thinking about this idea of, of a sabbatical for Doug, and so I want to just share with you kind of our heart behind it and what it is and why we're doing it and all that kind of stuff. So, what is a sabbatical? Well, it's defined as a time of rest, re rejuvenation, and replenishment, as Doug just taught on. Uh, sabbaticals are not unique to ministry positions. Many universities and corporate, corporate industries grant sabbaticals. Uh, I can think of several right here in Lubbock that do that. The root word of sabbatical comes from the word Sabbath, and is described several places in Scripture. It literally means to cease, to stop. Um, so a couple of things have come up. Why is Doug getting a sabbatical? First of all, I just say this. There's nothing wrong with Doug. Well, there's a lot of things wrong with Doug, but there's nothing particularly wrong with Doug. Uh, he's not going anywhere. Uh, he's not applying for another job, although he did put his... You want to share? Yeah, so on Friday I did... Uh, I told several of you I wasn't looking elsewhere, but Friday I did submit a resume and expressed interest. The Dallas Stars are looking for a head coaching uh, position. <laughs> and... Uh, so, I, I mean, I did. I sent my resume to a friend of mine who's the assistant general manager, and I, he replied back and said, you didn't make our short list. I said, like, I'm 5'5". Five five. How can I not make a, something called a short list? But uh, so anyway, yeah, I did. Uh, so he has no other leads, right? <laughs> um, so why is Doug getting a sabbatical? Uh, well, for those of you that don't know, Doug has been on staff here at Live Oak for over 15 years. Uh, he helped plant the church back in 1993. He was on staff for nine years, left for nine or is that right? Nine? Left for nine as a hockey missionary and then has been back for six. So uh, 27 years of ministry, we felt like it deserved a well-deserved rest and replenishment. So it is the belief of the elders uh, in order to set Doug up to be successful as our lead pastor, senior pastor. For the long term, we want him to get some time and some space to rest, to replenish. We want him to be in a good place physically, emotionally, spirit and spiritually. And a sabbatical will help him achieve this. We want to give Doug time to connect with God and with his family without the daily responsibilities and requirements of his position. That includes Sundays. So Clay, uh, uh, 
Clay Thomas, our worship pastor, and myself will be taking over most of the teaching duties, actually all the teaching duties while, while Doug is gone. So what are the specifics of Doug's sabbatical? Uh, it starts today right after service, so watch out. Don't let him run over you. Um, uh, it'll run till Sunday, June 3rd. Doug's email will be highly filtered by the lead team. Highly filtered. Uh, Doug has been asked not to come into the office during the regular work week. And Doug and his family's attendance at church functions and Sunday services is completely optional and up to them. Um, so you will probably see them, but it's up to them. So how can I help? I'm glad you asked how you can help. <laughs> Would you please pray regularly for Doug and his family? Pray specifically for rest, replenishment, and, con- and connection. Uh, please do not gossip. Uh, first of all, it's a sin. Don't speculate. I mean, we've t- we're telling you the truth. Uh, do not gossip. It's a sin. And I really think it dishonors Doug. And I think it dishonors this process of what we're trying to do for him. Uh, please be Doug and Jen's friend. Just because he is taking a sabbatical, he still needs friends. We don't live life in isolation, as he mentioned. It's okay to connect with Doug and Jen, to take him out to lunch, to have play dates. With... <laughs> so he's in favor of that. Uh, invite him to sporting events. Uh, some of you have offered your cabins uh, in the mountains. You may not know Doug, but he is not a mountain person. If you have a beach house, come talk to him after service. A a, a pool, anything. anything. So, we would ask you to please respect the boundaries um, of not contacting or speaking with Doug on church-related or ministry-related questions or requests. We truly want him to disengage. A sabbatical is to cease. We want him to disengage his mind and replenish. So, if you have church-related questions... Please reach out to one of our amazing staff members. Uh, You can utilize the awesome Live Oak app. There's great information on there. If you don't have it, you should have it. Everybody's doing it kind of thing. So the app is a great place to start. And you can also just uh, talk to the person who invited you to Live Oak or a a fellow attender here at Live Oak. Sometimes they may have the answer for you too. So that's all I have. Is there anything you want to add? Yeah, I I think it's, I'm, I'm an elder, but I'm not the lead elder. Uh, Mike McCain is the leader of our elders, and we're a team, and so we believe in the plurality of leadership, uh, including the teaching team. I am a teacher. I'm not the teacher. I'm the primary one, but Mark and Clay are on there as well, and so uh, this is just, I mean, our staff is fantastic, and they're awesome, and so the elders wanted to, I mean, now they're just going to pack me a little knapsack and send me off into the mesquite bushes, and I'm going to uh, live out there for six weeks, and I think I'm just going to build pillow forts and binge watch the Three Stooges or something, I don't, uh, but I, I'm just, I'm just, yeah. I'm, I'm looking forward to a pause. Uh, Mike Buchanan is going to pray for Doug, and uh, then we'll be done. Hey, one thing I want to mention, if you RSVP'd for the, mix, the meet and greet mixer after this, it's out on the playground. And if you're brand new, like this is your first Sunday, and you're like, hey, I would like to go to that, you're allowed to go because you couldn't have RSVP'd, okay? <laughs> Father, we, 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 we do thank you for this, for this time that we can come together and pray for Doug. Lord, we're so grateful for what he's been to our church and what he is to our church, he and his family. Lord, we're just so grateful for them. Lord, we just thank you for allowing him to fill our buckets for so many years. Father, we just pray that during this time of rest that you fill his bucket. Lord, just give him uh, complete rest and replenishment. Father, we just ask these things in your precious name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. All right. You are dismissed. Watch out so Doug doesn't run over you. Yeah. <laughs>